Κυρίες και κύριοι συνάδελφοι, καλημέρα. Θα ξεκινήσουμε τώρα τη συνεδρία στην οποία έχουμε ομιλητή τον καθηγητή και πρώην πρόεδρο της IGS, Χόρχε Ζόρμπεργκ. Εγώ δεν θα σας κρατήσω πολύ εδώ. Ε, απλώς εξηγώ το σκεπτικό της σημερινής συνεδρίας και διάλεξης. Η 4ΕΓΜ πάντα καλωσορίζει ε, πάρα πολύ ανοιχτά συνεργασίες με όλες τις αντελφές ενός, όπως έχουμε συνηθίσει να τις λέμε, μεταξύ των οποίων και τον Ελληνικό Σύνδεσμο Γεωσυνθετικών Υλικών. Με ιδιαίτερη χαρά, λοιπόν, υποδεχτήκαμε την πρόταση ε, του Προέδρου του, συνδέσμου, του Ελληνικού Συνδέσμου Γεωσυνθετικών Υλικών για να παραστεί στο συνέδριό μας και να δώσει τη διάλεξη που θα ακούσετε σε λίγο ο καθηγητής Χόρχε Ζόρμπενκ, ο οποίος είναι και πρόεδρος, πρώην πρόεδρος της Διεθνούς Ένωσης Γεωσυνθετικών Υλικών IGS. Οπότε, χωρίς άλλη καθυστέρηση από εμένα, uh, just a brief welcome only from our side, from the Hellenic Society and Soil Mechanics and Geotechnical Engineering. Ε, και καλό τον καθηγητή Ιωάννη Μάρκου, πρόεδρο του Ελληνικού Συνδέσμου Γεωσυνθετικών Υλικών στο Βήμα, για να προσφωνήσει τον Χόρχε Ζόρμπερκ. Καλημέρα κυρίες και κύριοι. Ε, εκ μέρους του Ελληνικού Συνδέσμου Γεωσυνθετικών Υλικών, από το βήμα αυτό να ευχαριστήσω και εγώ με τη σειρά μου τον κύριο Μιχάλη Μπαρδάνη, ε, πρόεδρο της Οργανωτικής Επιτροπής του Συνεδρίου και πρόεδρο της ε, Ελληνικής Επιστημονικής Εταιρείας Εδαφομηχανικής και Γεωτεχνικής Μηχανικής για την ε, αποδοχή της ε, πρότασής μας και την πολύ καλή συνεργασία που είχαμε η οποία οδήγησε στη σημερινή εκδήλωση με προσκεκλημένο μιλητή τον ε, καθηγητή ε, Ζόρμπεργκ. Ε, ενώ μιλώ ε, βλέπετε ένα σλάιντ με ε, τις ε, διευθύνσεις των, των, α, σελίδων, των σελίδων στο διαδίκτυο της IGS, International Geosynthetic Society, και του Greek chapter αυτής του Ελληνικού Συνδέσμου Γεωσυνθετικών Υλικών, όπου μπορείτε να βρείτε πληροφορίες και πληροφορίες για την ενδεχόμενη εγγραφή σας. Let me now continue in English in order to introduce uh, Professor Zorberg. Uh, it is a great uh, honor and uh, pleasure to have uh, Professor Zorberg with us to give this uh, very interesting le lecture today. Let me briefly uh, introduce him by uh, referring to the main of his accomplishments. Professor Zorberg has over 35 years of experience in practice and research in geotechnical and geosynthetics engineering. As an engineering consultant, he has been involved in the design of civil transportation, mining, and waste containment infrastructure. He has served as an expert witness in numerous litigation and forensic cases. As a researcher, he focuses on transportation geotechnics, geosynthetics, unsaturated soils, expansive clays, and environmental geotechnics. From 2010, To 2014, Professor Zorberg served as president of the International Geosynthetics Society, IGS. He served the Geo Institute of ASE in numerous roles, including chair of its Geosynthetics Technical Committee, its 2017 Geo Congress, and its International Activities Council. He has authored over 500 technical publications, edited several proceedings, and book chapters and been awarded three patents. Professor Zorberg has been invited to deliver keynote lectures in over 30 countries around the world. He has received many prestigious awards, including the Mercer Lecture, ASE's Crowes Medal, IGS Award, ASE's Collingwood Prize, and IGS Young Member Award, as well as the Presidential Early Career Award for Scientists and Engineers, awarded by the President of the United States. In 2019, the IGS established the Zonberg Lecture Award in recognition of his contributions to the geosynthetics discipline. Professor Zonberg, the floor is yours to give our, your lecture.
Thank you so much, Professor Bardanis, Professor Marco, for the kind introduction. It is such a pleasure for me to be here in Athens, in Greece. Um, yes, uh, I am here with an invitation from the Hellenic so uh, Geotechnical Society and the IGS chapter, the International Geosynthetics chapter here in Greece. Um, I look forward to the collaboration and the continuing conversation about the potential uh, that geosynthetics have uh, to benefit many of the geotechnical infrastructure. But in this talk, I'm gonna be talking about specifically about the use of geosynthetics in railways and roadways. As a general framework, we are gonna be looking at how geosynthetics can benefit this structural package. So it's more specifically, I'm gonna focus not only, not generically in transportation geotechniques, which is very broad, and geosynthetics can be used in many aspects in transportation geotechniques, but I'm only gonna focus on the structural package in roadways. And as a general framework, essentially what we're talking about is a multi-layer system. And, and what we're doing is we are trying to, statics is statics. If we have a load on the ground, it's gonna make it all the way to the subgrade because the load will be transferred to, to the subgrade. The issue is that by having these multiple layers and specifically stiff layers, we're trying to distribute that load in as wide of an area as possible in order to have as low of a contact pressure as possible when we get from the load from the surface, and I'm gonna be focusing on, ex, on, on flexible pavements all the way to the subgrade. This is a very, very important topic, and I personally believe that this is an area in which geosynthetics are used a lot, but we're only starting to tap, to, 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 to tap on the surface of how much benefits we can have from using geosynthetics in roadways. Just to give you a perspective, this is coming directly from Wikipedia. Hmm? This is the number, the, the, the worldwide road network, and we are talking about somewhere on the order of an, a density of 47 kilometers per 100 square meters on the surface of the earth. Just to give you a perspective of what this means, these are, we have in the world, 64 million kilometers of roads. If we were to, put one road after the other around the equator, we are talking about over 1,600 times going around the equator, just placing all the roads that we have in the world. Where is Greece in this? Well, in, in, in the ranking of by number of kilometers, you have a comparatively small area, you're ranked number 46. But what is interesting is that you rank with a, you have a density of 89 kilometers per square kilometers. That's significantly, that's twice the average. So you have a very important network to take good care of. And, and essentially what I'm gonna be discussing is how can geosynthetics, including geotextiles and geogrids and products such as geocells can be used to improve the performance to decrease the cost and to make these systems more sustainable when compared to a more conventional alternatives. So when talking about geosynthetics in roadway applications, I have some very good news for you. And it's a mouthful, so I'm gonna read it. There is a huge number of geosynthetics with a wide range of properties that can be used in numerous roadway applications to fulfill many different functions through a large variety of mechanisms. This is great news because we not only have one reason to use geosynthetics, but we have many different reasons. But I have some less than good news too. There's a huge number of geosynthetics with a wide range of properties that can be used in numerous roadway applications to fulfill many different functions through a large variety of mechanisms. So the, the world of geosynthetics in roadways can be so 
overwhelming and so significant and so many opportunities that a, a task in itself is to identify, it's not just use geosynthetics, it's use this type of geosynthetic with this property to fulfill this mechanism. So really understanding them is the task, is my objective here today, to tell you what are the many different opportunities and how different they are in order to enhance the behavior of roadways. So here we have, let me start with that. So we have the different functions of, of geosynthetics in roadways. And here we have our system and the different geosynthetics can provide different types of functions. This is ABC on geosynthetics, but I'm gonna package it all together here in the cross section of this roadway. So geosynthetics from the mechanical standpoint can serve just as separate, separate one type of material and keep it separated or different and not mixed with a different material over the design life of the structure. Or we can ask more, we can ask for reinforcement, developing enough, ten enough tensile forces to prevent breakage or collapse. Or I'm gonna call it stiffening. I, I, um, I, and we design roadways, design of roadways is not trivial because unlike slope stability, I would say slope stability is easy. We design for collapse. Collapse is easy, we understand it. We can, we can uh, quantify the moment of failure, a factor of safety. Roadways, we design them for serviceability. We design them for distress. That's much harder to quantify. So, but stiffening is gonna play a significant role. But we also can have hydraulic benefits, filtration and barriers and in-plane drainage. All of them can help significantly in uh, the performance of a roadway. But this is too much. These are all, we're not gonna use all of them in all projects. So let me tell you how these different functions of geosynthetics are packaged into what a transportation, a pavement engineer will need. And they are packaged in terms of applications. And in this lecture, I'm gonna talk to you about six of them. Six applications on, in which we are gonna commonly use, this is what the design will need. It will need to mitigate, one, mitigate the reflective cracking in structural asphalt overlays. Or two, they have a problem because they need to stabilize unbound aggregate layers, the base of the, of the, of the roadway. Or three, to reduce the intermixing. Or four, to reduce the moisture in the structural layers. Or five, if you have soft grounds, what is that you can, geosynthetics can come to help you? Or six, and I understand that uh, that may be also an issue, particularly in Cyprus, mitigate the problems, and in Texas, mitigate the problems associated with the presence of expensive clays. So these are the ap actual applications that we're gonna be talking about today. And this is related to the design objectives of the designer, of the owner, of the, of the facility of the road in this case. But as designer, I need to go, really what I want ultimately are the properties. And the properties, and that's why functions is important. Because if I, if I define the functions of the geosynthetic, I'm, I'm not saying what are the magnitude of the properties, I'm not saying what, are the what is the test that I need to do, but I know very, very much what is the range of properties that I'm gonna be dealing with. So it's not as, we use this, this product after an engineering design. Uh, and it's a long, long road to go from the objectives to the applications to the functions to the properties. And in this space, there is a missing link, a very important missing link. That missing link are the mechanisms. mechanisms. We need to go from the actual application through different mechanisms into the functions of the geosynthetics that we're gonna use. So this is gonna be the focus of this presentation. For each one of these, and these are listed from the top down in the structural package, from the asphalt, asphalt overlays to the unbound, to the base, unbound aggregates, to the inter, interface between the base or the sub base and the subgrade, and finally to the subgrade. We could list this differently. We could have discussed to mitigate cracks and problems associated with triggering undesirable cracks in the system and stabilize different layers, which is enhancing the properties that we need for each one of the layers. 
or to reduce detrimental effects such as intermixing or water. Mm, different ways to look at different applications. But we're going, essentially what I'm going to do, uh, and uh, I'm going to walk you through each one of these six applications. My intention is to tell you how different they are and what are the functions that we're going to tap onto. I may get, get you a little, for each one of them, a little peek up to new things that are coming for each one of these applications. But again, it, all this is honestly, if you, can, if you know this table, here's everything that I'm going to tell you. Hmm? So this is available online, and this is essentially going to tell you what are the different applications with the corresponding functions, benefits, and properties. Hmm? So these are the six functions, six, six applications that I'm going to be dealing with. And for each one of them, I'm going to tell you what is the application. What are the objectives? Why are we doing them? What are the mechanisms that are working in play in this, in this particular uh, application? How? And finally, the functions. Mm -hmm. And the functions are important because it tells me what are the abilities that the geosynthetic needs to fulfill in order to satisfy certain mechanisms. And ultimately, this is our goal, to quantify the properties, to specify them correctly, and to have them in the field. All right, so let's get started. Application number one, mitigation of asphalt reflective cracking objectives. This is, if you're familiar with this application, this is not a trivial one. Uh, pro probably is a complex one because there are many different strategies, all of them using geosynthetics in which we can benefit from, from this. But let me first step back and tell you what a reflective cracking is. As part of the strategy for extending the design life of a flexible pavement, you do not let the road get destroyed and then you come back and reconstruct it. Way ahead of time, when the road has reached a certain serviceability that you do not consider acceptable, you come back, you mill a fraction of the asphaltic layer, and you reconstruct that layer. But there is a problem with that. When you mill it, you are going to find a number of existing, pre-existing cracks. And these cracks are weak points for the brand new asphalt overlay. So then you're going to come and you're going to place, I don't know, 5 centimeters, 10 centimeters of asphalt on top of 20 centimeters of pre-existing asphalt. And but that, that asphalt has cracks. And because of shear, by the way, it's not an easy shear. It's, you shear in one way when the wheel comes, you shear in the other way when the wheel has passed by, you flex it when the wheel is on top of it. So you're asking a lot. So very soon you trigger, you, it's a very st high stress concentration that triggers the crack, the reflective crack. In some cases also temperature effects are gonna contract and expand. For example, if you have a, a, a rigid a, a pavement. Uh, but ultimately, and sometimes even before opening the road to traffic or soon after opening the road to traffic, you may end up having an undesirable reflection of those cracks. Uh, so here is when the geosynthetics come to help. Mm -hmm. But, and this is what makes it confusing. They can help in one way or in a second way or in a third way. But some of these ways in which geosynthetics can help are incompatible. One of them is going to be tension development. Essentially, we're going to ask the geosynthetic to develop some tension in order to distribute it. Remember that I told you that, that the cracks are reflected because there is a high stress concentration. You're going to distribute those strains over a wider area in order to not to trigger the crack. There's a second way, and I'm going to walk you through each one of these two separately because they, they are not necessarily trivial. Uh, stress relief. Again, you want the geosynthetic not to reflect the crack, so you're gonna force the crack to go somewhere, but not to the surface. There is a third one that is a moisture barrier. So if the crack occurs, what about if we prevent the water from continue infiltrating? Let me come back a little bit to the first and second mechanisms. This is what I mean by tension development. Uh, essentially, if we have here, can you see my mouth? Maybe not. That's okay. Uh, so if you have here, there you go. So if you have your brand new asphalt overlay sitting on top of a pre-existing crack, 
after some shear and flexion, you will have the stress concentration that triggers the crack. And essentially what you are gonna be doing by placing a geogrid that can develop tension, needs good bonding, essentially you're gonna, that tension is gonna allow the distribution of that, of those forces, of those strains over a wider area so that you are gonna minimize the stress concentration and avoid the reflection of the crack or retard the deflection of the crack. And again, we're talking about design force uh, serviceability. Mm -hmm. This is one alternative. There's a very different strategy. The other strategy is what is called stress relief mechanism. In this case, we're still gonna have, we're still gonna have the brand new asphalt overlays over the cracked pre-existing pavement. And now what we are gonna try again, we can have the development of the reflective crack as in the previous case, but in this case, we're gonna put a different type of geosynthetic with different properties, with different interfaces. And what we are gonna force now is essentially to trigger the reflection of that crack by releasing, not allowing the transfer of the displacements that occur in the pre-existing asphaltic layer to the new asphaltic layer. This is a very different mechanism. So my, we can design for tension development or we can design for stress relief. We cannot design for both. These are two different properties, that, two different sets of properties that we need to address these different mechanisms. The third one is a, is a barrier. Hmm? And the barrier can be combined with the previous, uh, with the previous uh, functions and, and mechanisms. So now that we know the mechanisms, it's only now that we can elect the functions. And again, in this case, for the first mechanism, tension development is a reinforcement mechanism. If I know the functions, and I'm not gonna get into exactly what the properties are, but we can find those properties. If we go for the second, that is the stress relief, it's more of a separator, different sets of properties. And we can combine this with, for example, or have just the barrier. But again, if you're gonna use a geosynthetic as a, in your asphaltic layer, yes, it's excellent. But you, just so you know, there are many different options that even for that benefit, you can tap into in order to make them work. Not all are gonna be the same. And as a designer, I will need to know which one of these benefits I want. All right, so we can combine reinforcement and barriers. There are many different types of geosynthetics that have been used as interlayers. Sometimes we call them interlayers. Can be geotextiles or glass geogrids or polymeric geogrids or geocomposites or hybrid geomats or sometimes strips hmm, that we're gonna place directly on top of the uh, cracks that may reflect. But again, highly engineered products with specific properties that we need to choose in order to achieve our goals. All right, I told you that I will, will, I will show you a peek of what is new about the, in this particular case, the use of geosynthetics to mitigate reflective crack. It turns out that some of the products, not all of them, but some of the products, in, they have been selected because you want to retard or eliminate reflective cracking, well, we know that that tension will also help in the structural capacity. Hmm? Will also help in the structural capacity. When we design the different layers, all essentially what we want is the, their capability to transfer traffic loads. We're not tapping into that, not because we suspect that it helps, but we do not know how, how much, and we want to quantify that. So there are important initiatives right now in order to quantify not only their delay on the reflective cracking, but also to quantify the benefits into increasing the structural capacity of the roadways. Let me just show you one example. Here we have, this is an accelerated payment testing facility in which we have different models, a model without reinforcement, a model with reinforcement. And what I show you here on the right is on the vertical axis, a measure of the performance of a roadway is the rutting depth. At the wheel path, what are the permanent deflections for a given number of passes? Mm -hmm. 
And here we had that for a given number of passes, the red, the, uh, which is a reinforced section, for the same number of passes has a significantly lower writing depth, permanent def deflections, uh, than the control section. So yes, these geosynthetics that we're currently specifying only to mitigate reflective cracking, they can also help extending the design life of the roadway. And here we have another example. On the top one is permanent deflections. So a different type of failure is fatigue. Oh, fatigue is different. We, we need many, many cycles to reach and compare the fatigue, but we can do better. If we measure, in this particular case, the strains, and this in the vertical axis, we have micro strains, very small strains. In the horizontal axis, we have the actual time. And we have, in this case, two, two hertz, so two loads per second. Mm? And you're gonna see that in the unreinforced, we have the wheel passing, passing, passing. And we're gonna have the peak, the load of the wheel, and the load of the wheel, and the load of the wheel. The, mag the, the magnitude of elastic strains that occur during the design life of the road is related to fatigue failure. Mm -hmm. So here we can see that the magnitude of the strains in the unreinforced section is for, its, for the same load is significantly larger than the elastic strains for the reinforced section. So not only we have less permanent deflections at the rutting, at the, at the wheel uh, um, path, but we are also observing the development of smaller elastic strains for a given load, which will translate into minimizing a fatigue failure. All right, so that was one out of six. Let me tell you the second, and we're going from the top down. Below the asphaltic layer, you have the base, unbound aggregate. What are the objectives? What is that we ask from this base? We ask modulus. Give me a high modulus. I want you to be stiff. That's what we want. We achieve it in multiple different ways. We achieve it with a thick layer. We achieve it with a very expensive, high quality aggregate layer. Or in this case, we can achieve it by not to have such a thick as a, a layer, but to reinforce it with, or to stabilize it with a geosynthetic, a geotextile or a geogrid. And this is gonna, this is gonna be very interesting how, how is it gonna work? Because the way that it's gonna work is gonna be not only by increasing the initial modulus, but more importantly, in my opinion, than that, is to decrease the, or to eliminate the degradation of the modulus over the design life. Let me tell you how this works. First, let me ask you, what is better, a gravel or a clay for as your base material or a silt or a low plasticity clay? What is better? A gravel. I would say it depends. I would say it depends because the, my gravel is unconfined Gravels are great. Granular materials are great, if confined. If you lose confinement, uh, honestly, just give me a clay. Hmm? Well, clay deforms. But, but, but you're, you're losing a lot of the benefits of your granular material if it is unconfined. And when we build these roads under the compaction, we lock in horizontal stresses that remain there. We want them to stay there and not to go away. So the mechanisms of this stabilization of unbound aggregate is gonna be, and there was a lot of discussion in the industry. What may, we know that it works. We do not know why. So if we put a geogrid, it's gonna perform better. It's gonna have a longer design life than without it. But why? And after a lot of discussions and evaluations, and this is a long story, the mechanism is one. It's called lateral restraint. Let me tell you what lateral restraint is with a cartoon. Here's our base. Again, the unbound aggregate that we discussed that is a gray material if confined, if confined. And it, the, the roads are born very strong and under high confinement. But the, there's no overburden. These are very shallow structures. These are very shallow geotechnical structures. So there's not a lot of, nat of, of geostatic confinement. A lot of the confinement comes from being locked in during construction. 
Now, as the, as the will passes keep coming and coming and coming, there's a tendency for those aggregates to displace laterally. Very tiny lateral displacements, fractions of a millimeter. But if this happens, and this is a cartoon that exaggerates that, if those lateral displacements happen, this creates a domino effect. The small lateral displacements create a loss in confinement. The loss in confinement create a loss in stiffness. The loss in stiffness create a concentration of the stresses, which is what we do not want, a high contact pressures at the contact between the base and the subgrade. All this because we have lost the, along the design life, we have lost the confinement that keeps the modulus high. So that's where the geosynthetics will, can come to help, essentially to keep those particles in place and minimize or eliminate those lateral deflections that will ultimately lead to the failure of the pavement because we're going to lose the confinement. All right. Now we know why this works. Not only after we know the mechanism is that we can tap into the right functions. And hopefully you agree with me that the function that I'm going to ask is only one. And is what I called as stiffening. High loads under low strengths and there are small displacements. This is the function that I am going to tap into. This is also particularly relevant and I'm not going to, I'm going to focus much more on roadways than on railways, but just so you know, uh, many of the applications that I'm discussing here apply also for the design of railways. Different materials, different objectives, but in this particular case we would essentially achieve the same stabilization, but in this case of the ballast on a railway system. In this particular case, we will achieve the similar goals, extending the ballast life, which means reducing the maintenance of the ballast, reduce the construction costs, providing uniform support, improving drainage, and essentially avoiding other alternatives such as chemical stabilization that will come with its own benefits and problems. Here we have an example of a retrofitting of, a, of a, the ballast in a system in a particular railway. All right, so what is new? What is new regarding stabilization of unbound aggregates? What you are seeing here is transparent soil. And I'm showing it to you because a lot of the research that is being developed in order to understand these low transfer and their small strains it has been done, or at least part of it, with transparent soil. It's not magic. It's a very pure soil. It's a very pure quartz, so pure that it has a very constant refractive index. And if you submerge it in a liquid that matches that refractive index, suddenly your quartz, your aggregate becomes transparent. And actually, in this case, you, you have a laser plane, and you can potentially see the particles where that laser plane is going through, very powerful. So for example, here we have tests in which we're mobilizing the tension, but this in here is confined, confined uh, geogrid. This is unconfined, this is confined. And the reason that it's confined is but it's submerged into a liquid that matches the refractive index. Again, why? To understand what is the load transfer under low dis small displacements this is the property that we need to capture what geosynthetics will work from those, what geosynthetics will work better for this particular application. And again, going back to the reason why this works, why do we need a, a new property? Don't we have enough properties already? Yeah, but we don't have this one. This one comes from after we concluded, and this is a historical figure from the early times when we were debating on what was the mechanism that makes this work. We know that it's lateral restraint, but if it is lateral restraint, this gives us a clue on what is the test that we need to do to obtain, and this is a mouthful, the confined stiffness of the soil geosynthetic composite. Mm -hmm. Ultimately stand by a test like this, it essentially under the confinement of aggregate, it's, but it's simple, we are going to be loading this geosynthetic, but we're not interested in the pool of resistance. We're not interested in the 
resisting that the moment of failure. We're interested in the mobilization of the load. What is the stiffness at the time of mobilization of the load? And is done in a test like this. So this is something that is being, is new, is being developed, has very recently, over April 2022, been implemented by the Texas Department of Transportation as the method that allows the distinction among a wide range of geosynthetics for this particular use to develop additional modulus in an unbound aggregate. All right. So we have two out of six. Let me go to number three. Number three is avoiding intermixing. Avoiding intermixing, the objective in here is that we have separate materials, hmm? separate materials. So uh, let's say a clay and a gravel. Hmm? Uh, we don't want to mix. We don't want to mix because if we have a mix of 80% gravel and 20% clay, what do you think that is going to behave the mix more like a clay or like the gravel? Like the clay. We don't want that intermixing. The, the gravel is very expensive. It's very important. Too expensive to lose it into the clay. And that's essentially the objective of this avoiding intermixing. So the mechanisms are two. One is a loss of unbound aggregate, loss of gravel particles into the subgrade, some form of localized bearing capacity failure. The other is, and this happens when there is water, so if you have water with a dynamic loading, you will generate positive forward water pressures that will pump up the fines into the base, contaminate the base. Both mechanisms are particularly detrimental to what that is what we want. We want a clean base that remains clean during the design life of the structure. And here we have a representation, a cartoonish representation of these two problems. Mm -hmm. One is the coarse aggregate uh, intruding into the, into the subgrade or some fines pumping up into the base, both of them detrimental. And essentially what it does, it decreases the thickness, effectively the f decreases the thickness of your base. If your base is 20 or 40 or half a meter centimeters, um, you want that, that thickness to remain during the design life of the structure. And the solution is very simple. The solution is just place a geotextile separator. These are very inexpensive products. In my opinion, if you have a clay subgrade, this should be mandatory. Because the reason for having a clay on top of a, a, a gravel on top of a clay is to remain a clean a gravel. And, oops. Okay, so it's to remain, to remain separate during the design life of the structure. Okay, so after knowing what are the mechanisms, we can easily identify the function or functions that are necessary. The function is gonna be a mechanical separation and we, there are properties that are associated with the separator. These are very easy properties. Essentially, we're gonna ask for the geosynthetic, typically a geotextile, exist. If the geotextile survives installation and transportation, that's all we're asking from it. Mm -hmm. But in addition, typically we're gonna, because we're typically gonna be in the presence of water, we're also gonna ask for filtration. Mm -hmm. All right, what is new? Well, we know that this is important. We know that this causes significant problems, this intermixing. We do not have data. We really don't have data to quantify this problem. Well, but guess what? When it, it talks about any new advances, yes. We're starting to get data to quantify the impact of intermixing versus not intermixing these, um, uh, the, the, the gravel and the subgrade materials. What I'm gonna show you is data from accelerated pavement testing and the, the, in a the small scale, reduced scale, but essentially what I'm gonna show you is that those parameters are being obtained. I'm just gonna show you some cartoons and some pictures of the test that was done. But ultimately, this is what we want. We want the vertical axis, we want the permanent deflection, which is a measure, the most important index of the performances of, of a road is the rutting depth versus the number of cycles. And this is in a log scale. So essentially what we see is for typical, and we need, when we design a road, we design, okay, 
we are going to call it failure once we have half an inch of a writing depth. So here we have, for example, for half an inch writing depth, this is failing after five cycles. This is failing after 80 cycles. Or depending on, on how many, how then essentially we're going to quantify the ratio of the number of cycles with the geosynthetic versus the number of cycles without it. And the, the ratios are shown in here, the same data but plotted differently. It's called the traffic benefit ratio. Essentially, a traffic benefit ratio of, let's say, for this half an inch, essentially is telling me that the design life with the separator is two and a half times the design life without a separator. Now we're quantifying the benefit of, in this particular case, the um, having a separator, just a simple separator in my design. Number four, four. Uh, we have gone over mitigating reflective cracking, uh, stabilizing the base, avoiding intermixing. Now let's get the water out of the system. There are many reasons why water can get into the structural system. And um, essentially, we can do a good service to our roads to improve the performance of the roads if we get rid of that water. By the way, this is something that my, my friends, the pavement designers, roadway designers, think that the road is going to, you design it for a dry condition and it's going to remain dry forever. Well, guess what? Sometimes they get wet. And when they get wet, the modulus drops. And when the modulus drops, significant rotting will occur. So there are at least two mechanisms by which water can be eliminated from the system. And this is not trivial. It's not trivial to eliminate, because we're not talking about the design under free water. We're not designing a drainage layer. We're designing, essentially our goal is to decrease the moisture content which is held under unsaturated conditions typically from the system. That's not trivial. So how, what are the mechanisms? I classify them in two. One is, I'm going to call it conventional gravity drain, uh, driven lateral drainage. This is essentially the drainage systems that we know of. Mm -hmm. When water liquid form, saturated conditions occur in contact with the drain, the water will enter the drain and we can eliminate it. We know very well how to design this. Geotextiles or in an extreme case, geonets can be used in this case. Let me show you a new one. Enhanced suction driven drains. This is not trivial. Essentially, because the water is held in the base material or in the subgrade under unsaturated conditions, the only way that we can steal that water from the soil it is with suction. When it's small volumes of water, small volumes of water. Um, but, um, but we need to remove them from the soil and drain it out. That's not trivial. But if we were managing to drain it out, we are going to do a good service to our road. Because if there, are, there are multiple mechanisms by which water can infiltrate. And any of these mechanisms make its way through, we're going to have accumulation of moisture, increase in moisture, not necessarily saturation. And the modulus will drop, and the rotting depth will increase. So the objective is to keep that water out. All right, so now that we identify the, the mechanisms, we can go into the functions. What functions do we need? Typically, we will need a separator. Typically, we will need a separator. Typically, we need a filter. So the pores size needs to be structured so that the water gets through, but the particles do not. This is a filter. And finally, the drains. All right. So I told you that I will tell you something new about each one. Let me tell you something new. That is these materials that are called wicking geotextiles. Any new advance? Yes, we are going to ask the geotextile to drain, but not in the, drain, in the way that we ask it to drain in a regular way. The way that we think that it drains, essentially we have fibers in a geotextile. The fibers get together into yarns. The yarns get together to form the geotextile. And the water, we think of big, these are big pores, like a gravel, uh, for the, the, the porosity. And, and the water, if the pore of water fills the geotextile, we're typically thinking of the water 
feeling in between the yarns, but that's not what we're talking about. It is not what we're talking about within the yarns. What we're talking about is water that drains within grooves of the fiber. So the cross here, we have the cross section of the fibers. These are not capillary tubes in the sense that they are not closed, but there are grooves that create enough surface. This surface creates surface tension that ultimately will drain as we have in capillary tubes. So now we're talking. So we're not talking about draining this volume of water. We're talking about small volumes, small flows that will only drain stealing the water that is held under in the soil under suction. We're also going to steal it with suction. And the drainage is going to occur within the core, within the grooves in these fibers. This is what is the principle of capillary flow in these systems. How much? Very small. It's comparatively very small. Uh, it is on the order of five times ten, maybe ten liters per meter. Ten liters per meter per day. Ten liters per meter per day. My my friends in the U.S. they do not know what is a liter. So uh, so I, I tell them, okay, ten bottles of wine per meter per day. Mm -hmm. So that is. But again, that flow is essentially. It, it may take. It's not immediate but it's essentially it's decreasing the moisture that it otherwise will be held for long periods of time in the clay. All right, so the properties that we want, here is another view of a conventional fiber versus how it works in a wicking fiber, and this system works. Here we have, for example, the use of this system to, in this particular case, the main problem was to eliminate water that rises by capillarity and eventually would freeze. This is in Alaska. And, and you, there's no question where the geotextile is, has been placed. In this particular, we have the difference between the wet and the dry soils. All right, now we're in the subgrade. What can geosynthetics do to our subgrade? One, we know that if we have a soft subgrade, we are in trouble. And sometimes we cannot even get started with our project. And essentially our goal now is to increase the bearing capacity in our soft subgrade. And just synthetics can help. But the mechanisms are different than the ones that I discussed so far. Let me tell you what the mechanisms are. And again, this is after long evaluation. Again, we know that it works, but why it works. Let me tell you what is a synthesis on what it works. The main mechanism is called vertical restraint. Vertical restraint. And essentially what we're going to do is we're going to add, with the presence of a geosynthetic, a surcharge to increase the, bear the bearing capacity of the clay. I'm going to show you a cartoon about that. There is another mechanism that in the past we thought that it was so important that was considered many design methods were developed considering this mechanism, but now we realize that it's not that the mechanism doesn't exist, but the magnitude of the benefit is, is secondary. It's called membrane effect. Let me tell you what this works. Now we're, talking, we're transferring the load all the way from the gr ground surface to the subgrade. And as the deflections occur, essentially this is what we want to avoid. We want to avoid a sheer failure in the subgrade. How are we going to avoid our, the problems associated with the shear failure? Is by placing the geosynthetic on, the, on top of the subgrade in contact with the subbase or the base. What is this geosynthetic going to do? This geosynthetic is going to develop tension. And you can think this tension geomembrane will help in two ways. Way number one is, <clears throat> well, if there is an out of plane, and typically this is very relevant for, for um, unpaved roads where you can tolerate significant rutting depths. Mm -hmm. So this deflection on the geosynthetic will create an out of plane, think of a membrane effect, vertical load that is gonna decrease, take part of the load that comes from the wheel. That's advantage, advantageous, but that's not the main advantage. The main advantage comes with what the geosynthetic does 
beyond the will path. Beyond the will path, we have a different mechanism. Essentially, the geosynthetics pushing up right under the will path, and the geosynthetics pushing down beyond the will path. This is a very incapacitated problem. Mm -hmm. Remember Terzaghi, Terzaghi. Mm -hmm. So ultimate bearing capacity, remember that? C and C plus Q and Q. Essentially what we are adding is a load beyond the loaded area that is adding a surcharge and is contributing to the bearing capacity of the system. That is considered to be the most relevant contribution out of the many different com uh, contributions, but that is the most do the dominant benefit comes from there. All right, so now that only after we understood the mechanisms is that we know how to come up, what to ask from the geosynthetics, and what we are gonna ask is reinforcement. And we also, this, the, the stiffness is relevant. And typically, these soft soils are prone to saturation or, or high moisture content, so we're going to add the separation and the filtration. Um, <clears throat> when it comes to what is new in this area, let me take now for this particular application to discuss the benefit on sustainability. On sustainability. Very often, when we get rid of a thick base and it, we replace it with a thinner base because we use the geosynthetic, the contribution to, let's say, different measures of sustainability, maybe the carbon footprint, hmm, will be significant. Let me tell you about one case history, and I, we did quantify the sustainability benefits in this particular case. This is a very controversial project, highly politicized, is the new international airport in Mexico City. It's a major project. Just so you know, Mexico City is the major is an old lake, very, very soft soils. Mm -hmm. And well, the area that where they found for the new airport, guess what? It was the lousiest soils that can possibly exist in that major capital. So very, particularly very soft soils. We're talking about a predicted settlement on the order of one meter. Mm -hmm. That's the soil that we're talking about. So a significant number of geosynthetics were used, very big volumes. And in particular, I'm gonna ask you, show you one specific aspect that was, actually was not an unpaved road, it was an unpaved area where there were two options. And I'm gonna tell you the carbon footprint of those different two options. So alternative number one was essentially place a thick the, the, the goal, if you have a soft soil and you do not use geosynthetics, the, the way to solve that problem is just place a big, thick aggregate layer. Mm -hmm. uh, and essentially when you put geosynthetics and use geosynthetics, that thickness decreases. Mm -hmm. So this is option one. It was a particular, the locally available granular material that is called tesontle. The local material is a volcanic material that is available in, in the area. The option two, it was 90 centimeters thick on top of the soft soil. But if you were to use a geosynthetic, instead of 90 centimeters, you could use 50. Significant decrease. So what I'm gonna show you is the car what is called the carbon audit. And only up to the time of construction. Mm -hmm. Only up to the time of construction, not at the end of the design life. Um, so here it is. Mm -hmm. The components on the carbon footprint um, that were considered are the material footprint, the haulage, the, the transportation, and the construction. And the difference is between essentially the, the, the option with only granular material. This would be very different actually, much more representative, much more beneficial if we, beneficial, much more difference in the carbon footprint if we had an asphaltic layer. If we have an asphaltic layer, if you have cement, some, any form of chemical stabilization, this would skyrocket the carbon footprint. But in this case, even if it's not under those conditions, we're talking about a benefit of 35% decrease in the carbon footprint when using a geosynthetic versus the alternative of using just an aggregate. I don't know if you're familiar with what a carbon footprint is, but if, for example, every, and, and this is a, the savings of, um, we have a savings of 48 tons per kilometer per lane. Mm -hmm. 
So in one kilometer lane, we have 48 tons of carbon footprint saved by choosing alternative two versus alternative one. One ton of carbon footprint is the, essentially the carbon dioxide that is sequ sequestered by half an hectare of forest. Mm -hmm. So by, by doing this, essentially we're saving 24 forests, 24 hectares of forest per lane per kilometer in this project. All right, last, mitigation of distress induced by shrink swell soils. In this particular case, the objectives are to retard, we're talking about reflective cracking, it's not reflective cracking, longitudinal cracks, cracks on the surface, in the surface that are induced in locations that are prone to frost heave, that I understand that is not your problem, or expansive place. I understand that is your problem in some areas of Greece, in many areas of Cyprus. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you what is the, what are, there may be many strategies if you have problems associated with expansive place. Let me tell you some. And then I'll tell you about one of them, not because necessarily it's the best, it's the one that I have experience with and that I have data, field data to tell you this works. But the many, uh, the, the objectives are to maintain the integrity of the unbound aggregate and the other, uh, one alternative is to maintain the integrity of the unbound aggregate. A second alternative is to control the moisture in, this, in the volume susceptible layers. A third a mechanism, a alternative or strategy is to reinforce the asphaltic surface. The fourth a, a strategy would be to minimize moisture access. All of them have good potential to work, but the one that I'm going to focus on is by maintaining the integrity of the unbound aggregate layer. Why? Because that's the alternative that I have experience with and I can claim basis for telling you, yes, this works. What we're gonna do is something very similar to what we did for the unbound aggregate stabilization. We're gonna maintain the lateral draining, uh, lateral restraint. We're gonna avoid the, the me mechanisms that mobilize movement of aggregate particles and we're gonna add ductility to the system. Ultimately, what we are gonna do, by the way, do you know why the, if you are driving by a, a location where there are longitudinal cracks, longitudinal cracks, those are not caused by traffic. Those are not caused by traffic. Don't blame the traffic. The problem is that during the wet season, the shoulders get more moisture than the center line. The shoulders will heave. And we're, I'm talking about somewhere in the order of three centimeters, four, five, six centimeters per event. During the wet, during the dry season, the shoulders will, will be the first ones to dry out. They will settle in relation to the center line. When they settle at the end of the dry season, that's when you're gonna see those longitudinal cracks. It's mechanics. Hmm? They're creating these longitudinal cracks in this system. Um, <clears throat> so this is what is gonna happen if we have a regular road over expansive place. There's going to have essentially heaving during the wet seasons and settlement during the dry season. During the dry seasons is when we're going to have the development of the longitudinal cracks. Mm -hmm. And the idea is that if we have geosynthetic to maintain the integrity of the unbound aggregate, what we're going to do is essentially those movements will occur. It's not that geosynthetic is there to avoid the movements. No, the movements will occur. What will not occur is the triggering of the longitudinal cracks. And this is the cartoon that represents that. So what are the functions that we're gonna need if we adopt this strategy? It's the same one that we adopted for stabilization of unbound aggregates to increase the modulus and the a mechanism is, a, um, the mechanism is a stiffening, stiffening of the base. So what is new? What is new in this area? Well, in the, with this application, we're, we're starting to not only identify that this is a mechanism that, uh, this is a strategy that helps, but we're also quantifying that benefit. Here, what you see here <coughs> is a test section in a real road, but test sections were implemented. On the right, two, two, two lanes. Hmm? 
uh, both of them, the same soil, same weather conditions, same precipitation conditions, same traffic. Why one has so many cracks and the other doesn't? Well, this was stabilized with, this was stabilized with geosynthetics, this was not. Mm -hmm. um, so we're starting to quantify the impact, in this particular case, the development of the longitudinal cracks um, when using geosynthetics. This is the control section, this is the geosynthetic stabilized section. Actually, in this particular project, we have over 30 test sections, multiple repeats of the same, but here we have the development, the vertical axis crack percentage. Uh, this is the length in a given test section, the length of a longitudinal crack in relation to the entire length. 30% mm -hmm. could be more than 100%. 200% longitudinal cracks means that you have two parallel cracks over the entire length of the test section. But here you see over one season the increase in the percentage of longitudinal cracks. This is a control section. And these are three different geosynthetics. It's not a coincidence that they are performing similarly because they were chosen with what at the time we felt that were the properties that would make them similar. The surprise actually was uh, the not so good performance of, in Texas at least, we stabilized the subgrades with, with lime and we found that this did not. The lime stabilized sections, but but to, to fairness to lime stabilized section is that is the following. Sometimes they say, okay, you need to lime stabilize. Okay, you need to lime stabilize 50 centimeters. I say, I don't have money for 50 centimeters. I'm gonna stabilize only 10 centimeters. Bad choice. Mm -hmm. So a partial stabilization using, in this particular case, lime stabilization is not good because the volumetric changes will still occur less, but will still occur and now you have created a brittle crust, a brittle surface. And if your objective is to minimize cracks, that's not a good strategy, which is not the case in, with geosynthetics. With geosynthetics, if you don't have the money to pay for the best geosynthetic, the not, not the best geosynthetic is gonna improve, but not as much as the best geosynthetic. All right, so conclusions. So I did walk you through six different applications and I have experience with all six. Uh, the applications of geosynthetics in roadways involve well-defined mechanisms. This is my message. We know the mechanisms, we know the functions, which lead to the properties. It's not just because we saw it used in the past that we need to repeat it. We need a design. We need what properties do you need, and consequently different properties. But we have seen that there is significant opportunities for improving road performance with geosynthetic in applications, and I walked you through six one of them. Six, six of them. Mitigation of reflective cracking in structural asphalt overlays. If you have problems with uh, finding enough or cost-effective unbound aggregate, you can ask the help from geosynthetics. Avoiding intermixing of different materials. Avoiding the presence of water. Stabilizing soft subgrades if your problem is bearing capacity on the, and the last one, which was minimizing problems associated with volumetric changes in the subgrade. Now, <clears throat> we need to identify, after having identified the mechanisms, is that we are gonna go the next step and identify the right functions. And the good news is that there are significant advances towards, uh, towards finding what are the different applications and what are the associated mechanisms with that. As final remarks, I'm gonna mention that uh, roll grade applications, just synthetics have always shown to improve and often very significantly performance. We not only want good performance, but we want cost effectiveness, effectiveness Generally, not always, but generally, geosynthetics will lead to a cost-effective solution. And I would say that very consistently, geosynthetics are gonna lead to more sustainable alternatives. So with that,
I know that we are used to do and we feel comfortable in using what we have been using in the past for many, many years, decades, and centuries. But I encourage you <clears throat> to potentially think differently and start using new technologies. And <clears throat> with that, uh, Sas Efaristo Poli. Thank you.